Sometimes I wonder how frequently preachers and people such as myself love to sort of dig into sort of a lot of the things on the margins, on the edges of our faith, maybe some of the stories, and uh, don't focus enough on that which is at the very center of our faith. Because sometimes I wonder if we don't... uh, fully understand what the Gospels sometimes are saying to us. And such is the case with the resurrection. I I suppose for most of my time when I think about the resurrection, and I think about what the actual impact that the resurrection has on my life and your life, what how does the resurrection change the way that you and I live on, on a daily basis? I suppose the thing that I usually think of is liberation from death, right? That there's through, through Jesus, there, there is life after death, right? That's through, through the resurrection, right? And I think, you know, there's, a, there's some, something powerful about, about knowing that, that death has no power over us. And there's a lot of people that have written some very powerful stuff about that. And that's really at, at the heart of the gospel. But that's not everything that the gospels say about what the resurrection does. And in this passage in Luke, Luke doesn't emphasize that at all. If you, you, got, you got the gospel right in front of you. You can look at the, at the bottom of the gospel. It says, thus it is written, um, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. In this passage, in this moment, in the words of Jesus, that is what happens when he's raised from the dead. We're given the gift of repentance and the gift of forgiveness of sins. And my question is, how often are we aware of how profound that gift is? Repentance means turning around. One of the gifts of the resurrection is the fact that we are allowed, we're given the gift of being able to change our lives. God is saying, you can change your life. You can turn around and live your life in a new way. In a world where most people see life as something inevitable, where you've been given a certain course, you've been dealt a certain deck of cards, you've been dealt a hand, right? And you're just going to play that hand out. That's not what the gospel says. The gift of the resurrection means you can change your life. And forgiveness of sins. How profound and radical is that? If we, if we go in, sometimes we'll have to go into the Greek words. If we go into the Greek words, the, the, the similarities are um, being released from bondage. Being released from imprisonment. Having no debt. Jesus is saying that because of the resurrection, you owe God Nothing. There is nothing more to be paid. You are free. You don't owe God anything. How profound is that? And then the message goes on, and Jesus says, proclaim this to every nation. The Greek word is ethnos, ethnicity. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what your family says. It doesn't matter what's going on in your village or community. Jesus is saying, I don't care who you are or where you come from. You don't owe God anything. You're free. And he preached that at a time, of course, where a lot of religions, I think, exerted a lot of power over people and over their choices and over their ideas. And I think a lot of people owed a lot of these religions a lot of money and time. But the gospel says the exact opposite. But in the eyes of God... Through Jesus. You don't owe God anything. And what do you have to do to get this incredible gift? Believe. Believe that Jesus is telling the truth. How radical is that? And of course, it changes our life in a profound way because we are now living a life where we're liberated, where we might have had a millstone around our neck of all of these holy and sacred obligations to God, which we've been liberated from, and so we're free to treat human beings in a very different way. 
Right? What Jesus is doing is he's saying all these massive obligations that you're giving over, these hours and hours and hours giving over to these sacred powers, you don't have to give that anymore. But all these people that live in your midst, they're not just important. They're how you're going to encounter me, the face of God. Life is sacred. And so you have a, a gift, the gift of liberation that you can then give to other people. You can love in a radical way because you're free. You're emotionally free. You're spiritually free to love. And so the people around you are going to be transformed. You're going to live in radical relationship to other people. I wonder if this message is going to become more and more important in our world. And more important for us to see ourselves as liberated, surrounded by people who might be um, burdened by guilt and obligation. I wonder if we think of ourselves in this church. Sometimes I wonder if when we're thinking about inviting a friend to church, we're thinking, do I want, do I want to give them the same burden of going to church that I feel? Do I want them to have the Sunday morning burden just like me? They seem so happy. Why would I do that to them? Perhaps it's the exact opposite. Perhaps we are in the unique position of feeling free and liberated in a world where people are burdened with an enormous amount of guilt and obligation. Sometimes it's very obvious what that guilt might be, but I think sometimes people have these very heavy spiritual burdens that they're carrying around. People that would describe themselves as secular or maybe even atheist have enormous spiritual burdens. And what might it be like for them to suddenly be free of those burdens? How might they live a life differently? How might they love differently, knowing that they're free? That their sins have been forgiven? That they can change their life? What kind of gift might that be? And do we see our faith as that kind of gift? I can tell you from my own personal experience, and I wonder sometimes if this gets to me after a while, where every time I go into a hospital with a suit and a clergy collar on, they think I'm there because somebody died. <laughs> right? Where I, if I tell someone that I'm a priest, they assume that I'm going to judge them. And sometimes the first thing in response is an apology of some kind. <laughs> and those constant interactions of associating church with guilt... Church with shame. Church with death. I wonder if that's slowly shaping me in a way that's not helpful, and this is why I need to preach this sermon right now. Because we're preaching and living the exact opposite message. We're not preaching a gospel of shame and guilt. We're preaching a gospel that says there's nothing that you need to be ashamed of in the eyes of God. You're free. Why do you come to church? Because it feels great. It feels great to be reminded that you're free. It feels great to be surrounded by other people who love people. It feels great to be in a loving community. It feels great to give. It feels great to give thanks. It's supposed to be a party. And we, we can't describe this. There's a lot of weird, abstract things that go on in our brains and in our hearts and in our souls. We can't be very specific about it. We can't just have a big cake saying, congratulations. You know, Jeff, I, I, I'm getting strange now, but I'm just saying it's, <laughs> church is weird. I, I just have to concede that church is rather strange, but it's supposed to be a party celebrating our liberation. That God has given us a life to live and love and be free in the eyes of God. I don't know if we're always aware of that. There's something profound about being Christian, that we're free to live and to love, and to be, to be loved in the eyes of God. This should have been my Easter sermon, to be honest. So give thanks. Give thanks that you don't owe God anything, that you're beloved in the eyes of God, and that you can find holiness and sacredness in the eyes of people around you, and you're liberated and free to be radically loving. Not out of a sense of guilt, but out of joy. 
and thanksgiving. Amen.